tuned in to the Andrew Lawton Show. We're doing all the nostalgia here, but talking about kids is a good segue into our next topic, which is the reality that most Canadians are not having them. Or I shouldn't say most, but Canadians are having children in fewer and fewer numbers. And I would say fewer and fewer young Canadians are coupling up and actually building that basis of a family that might in turn have children. We have a fertility rate that is well below replacement and no one from a policy perspective has really decided to tackle this head on, which is why we end up talking about this in the context of immigration as a population growth mechanism because there are not Canadian families having kids with enough numbers to increase the population that way. It's a third rail in politics and policy. We talked about it a little while ago with Ginny Roth when we caught up at the Canada Strong and Free Network conference, but it was delved into in a very thoughtful piece that was published at The Hub. We are not taking Canada's fertility crisis seriously enough. The author of that is Dr. Tim Sargent, who's a distinguished fellow with the Center for International Governance Innovation and also the Deputy Executive Director at the Center for the Study of Living Standards. Tim, it's good to talk to you. Thanks so much for writing this and for coming on today. Thanks for having me, Andrew. So let's begin by talking about the term crisis here. And, and why is this, in your view, something we can call that? Well, for me, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a slow motion crisis, but it's a crisis nonetheless. Um, you have a society that's basically not reproducing itself. Um, you know, that's not a society that's probably going to exist over the very long term. And it's a little bit like, like boiling the frog. We've had below replacement fertility rates for quite some time, but we've seen just in the last 10 years, our fertility rates gone from 1.6, which you know, wasn't great, but it was a similar level to countries like the UK, the US, and now it's down to 1.3 and it's dropped quite rapidly. And this is something that started before COVID. So it's related to something I think quite deep seated in, in our society. Uh, one of the things that uh, I, I find interesting is that we used to, people that talk about this issue and look at this issue, look at Japan as being the worst of the worst. Uh, Japan has always been the standout example of a, a country with a true fertility crisis, and they're at 1.3. So we're right. at really what we've always looked at as being the worst in this around the world. That's right. So we always used to look at a country like Germany, for instance, and, and say that, well, they had a lower fertility rate than us. But now Germany is higher than us. We're at 1.33. They're at, they're at 1.45. So it, we really are dropping down the league tables here. And we're down to levels close to Italy or, Italy or Japan. You know, we're not as bad as a, as a Korea, for instance, which is now down at 0.72. Um, but we're still at, at you know quite low levels now. I mean, what, what 1.3 means is that for every 10 Canadians, there will be only four grandchildren. Now, the one thing, I mean, there, there are two aspects of this. There's the domestic picture, and then there's the global picture. And the one thing that we fail to uh, take into consideration, even if you, you say, okay, well, Canada can perhaps grow its population by immigration, well, that still isn't changing the global crisis that we see unfolding, because this is happening around the world. Countries like Hungary that have really, uh, as a matter of government policy, tried to right this trend are, are in short supply. What, what do you think that is? Is it that countries are, are just uninterested in talking about this issue because there is a, because they, they just are, are scared of it, they're afraid of the, the politicization of it, or is it that no one has found a solution? Um, I mean, I think it's both. Um, I mean, you have some countries, I mean, Hungary is one, but of course, uh, even in Canada, if you look at Quebec, for instance, in the late 1980s mm -hmm. and early 1990s, they were introducing policy to encourage people to have more children. Um, I mean, partly, I think nobody wants to be seen to be telling women how many children that they should have. Um, you know, nobody wants a sort of a handmaid's tale kind of uh, society. Um, but the reality is, if you actually ask women how many children they want, they will generally say more than more than two. On average, it's a little bit more than two. That's true, not just in Canada, but across across the Western world. Um, so then the question is, why aren't women having having more children, even though they say that that's what they want. Um, you know, urbanization, um, I think, is, is, is a key factor here. Obviously, people, you know, have more money. Um, you know, they're, they're likely to find leisure pursuits and things, you know, ways to spend that money um, uh, rather than uh, starting a family. Um, if you look at countries around the world, I mean, nobody's, nobody's had huge success. Um, 
even in a country like Hungary, where now, you know, if, you, if, if you're a woman and you have four children, you don't pay any income tax, um, which sounds, I think, pretty attractive to, to a lot of us. Um, they've managed to move their birth rate up, but they're still significantly below fertility. Um, countries like, like Poland have, have tried this as well, uh, at least tried to increase fertility. So we're seeing, you know, perhaps, a, you know, doing a little bit better. Um, Quebec, when it, it had its uh, baby bonus, did see its fertility rate tick up from around about 1.4 to around about 1.6, 1.7. Um, so countries do seem to have some success on the margin, but the only advanced country now that has an above replacement rate fertility is, is Israel. Um, and of course, there's some very special circumstances around Israel. There's a wicked problem aspect here in, in that you have a number of different, you know, influencing factors here and you could tackle one and not the other. I mean, one that you touch on in your study is the uh, delay in many young Canadians in leaving home. So if you have one fifth of adults, 25 to 34, living with their their parents, these are the data you've showed then that, that, that raises a number of practical challenges to uh, your dating life, for example. It, it raises challenges then in, in partnering up with someone where you, so that, that's one example. And we can look at then, okay, why are Canadians living at, their, living at home? Is it economic? Okay, well, we have an economic issue, a housing issue. You could solve that and you maybe have only accounted for, let's say 10% of the problem uh, when you have all of these other factors. Exactly. Um, so you have to kind of look at people's life uh, cycles here. I mean, you know, in order to have a children, you know, first, you know, most people will want to be in a couple before they do that. Um, in order to be a couple, most people, you know, need to kind of leave home and, and set up a new family uh, unit. So, you know, certainly there are explanations like housing, for instance. I mean, if you want to leave home, you need somewhere to live you're going to start a family. You probably want a bigger house. So those are explanations that, that do touch at um, this whole uh, sequence of events that needs to happen. Um, but there's probably some deeper social co cultural things going on as well. And as you say, Andrew, you know, you can't just look at one aspect of this problem. There, there seems to be something that the traditional model of, you know, you, you grow up, you, you leave home, start, a, you know, find a, find a, a life partner um, and then have children. That traditional model just doesn't seem to be as popular amongst Canadians or frankly across the Western world as it used to be. It's still what most people are doing, but fewer and fewer people are doing it. I've heard mixed, um, sort of mixed weight given to economic factors for people not having children, because I think we often hear, oh, it's too expensive to have kids, it's too difficult. But I've also heard some uh, studies that have showed that's really not the reason people aren't, that very few people are, are refraining from having children because of the cost. And I was wondering if you could weigh in on that. Sure. I mean, you know, the reality is our, our grandparents, you know, had, had way less in terms of resources than we have, um, and yet tended to have more children. Um, you know, my grandmother lived in a small village in the north of Yorkshire, and her husband was a farm laborer, and they had four children. Um, so, you know, some of these economic arguments don't really work. Um, generally, what we see is the more money people have, the fewer kids that they're having. Mm. Um, and so, you know, I think to say, well, you know, we, we can't afford children, well, okay, but you know, why wasn't that true 20, 30 years ago? Because certainly, although incomes have been, you know, haven't really been uh, advancing that much in Canada the last, the last couple of years, if you look over the last couple of decades, um, people now are a lot better off than they were 20, 30 years ago. Uh, in your proposals of, of just possible uh, policies that we could include, one that I found interesting because it, it's not off, I don't often see it in this context, was uh, looking at ways to reduce the formal educational requirements for jobs. So uh, to actually basically get people into the labor market earlier. And I was wondering if you could expound on that a bit. Sure, because I think well, one thing that's happening is people are spending longer and longer in formal education. And you know, particularly for, for women, that's a problem because... Fertility for women starts to fall after the age of 30 and, and, and falls quite significantly after the, the age of 35. So the more time you're spending in formal education and people usually, you know, for obvious reasons, want to put off starting a family until they've completed their formal education. Often you want to get the kind of that first job, get your first step on the career ladder before having a family. So all of that is narrowing the window that people have to start a family and, and have children. Um, and so I think we do need to ask ourselves as a society, you know, do we necessarily need the, you know, the credentials? Do we need people to be spending quite as long in, in formal education as they, as they currently do? Um, 
you know, Canadians are we're a very, very educated society and, and that's a good thing. But you know, we now have so many people going to university. There are certainly a number of researchers have raised the idea that we may just be getting into a bit of a rat race. Um, you know, think of medical school, for instance, huge number of people applying to medical school. And so um, you can be choosier about who you take, you know, in you know, times gone by, it may have been just enough to have had a medical degree, but now people want you to do another degree first, and then maybe a master's degree, and then maybe some, 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 some other um, training as well before you even get into medical school, which is to say nothing about the amount of time that you have to, to spend there. So it's what economists call credentialism. So the idea is that you know, university often just simply acts as a way to, to, to filter people um, according to ability um, and spending five years there as opposed to three years isn't necessarily improving your, 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 your human capital or employers are just using uh, university as, as a sorting mechanism, um, which is all very well, but it means that more and more of, of people's reproductive years are being spent you know, going and getting these credentials. Well, and there's also been a decline of careers. I mean, we've all heard sort of the rise of the gig economy. And I think that, you right. know, the gig economy in some ways has been a positive. It gives people opportunities and flexibility and whatnot. But a lot of that is not coming about because someone has chosen to engage in gig work. It's because it's been available to them. And that idea, I mean, not that we're ever going to go back to the days where, you know, you started a company and you're there for 40 years and you retire and it's great. Like, I, I think that era is, is pretty much over. But the the, the inability for a lot of people or the apparent inability to right. find a career that gives them that stability is, I think, not helping. Oh, absolutely. I mean, when you know, having a family is even even getting married and, and, and settling down and buying a house, I mean, that, that's a bet on the future. And so you need to have a pretty positive view of the future. You need to have an idea that there's a, you know, there's, that, 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 that there's a bit of a ladder there, um, you know, hopefully that you'll you know, you'll have uh, a fairly safe um, and stable stream of income. And when you ask people about, about the future, um, you, Canadians are much more, especially young Canadians, are much more worried about the future than, than they used to be, We're much more concerned about their ability to, you know, to, to have a house, to, ha to have a decent income. Um, and so, I, as you say, Andrew, yes, people may be you know, making enough now, but will that stream continue in the future? People just aren't as sure of that as they might have been 20, 30, 40 years ago when the labor market looked quite different. Well, it's a fascinating piece in The Hub. And if that uh, is not enough for you, you should go and read the actual report in the McDonald laurie Institute, uh, which is uh, 56 pages, but very readable and I think very significant. Uh, Dr. Tim Sargent, well done. And thank you so much for uh, coming on. Thanks for having me, Andrew. Thanks for listening to The Andrew Lawton Show. Support the program by donating to True North at www.tnc.news.